So when I tell people I work on tuberculosis, I often get asked, is that still a problem? And maybe it's a reasonable question. Tuberculosis, or TB for short, used to be a devastating disease. Indeed, uh, John Bunyan called it the captain of all these men of death. It's probably the most deadly disease that this planet has ever seen. There's evidence to suggest that it's been with us for the last 70,000 years or more. And in the last 200 years alone, it's been responsible for over a billion deaths. TB used to be a massive problem in Europe and the UK. And in London alone, at the start of the 1700s, one in seven people died from TB. By the start of the 1800s, that number had gone to one in four. But nowadays, we don't really see that much of TB in the UK anymore. So from the start of the 20th century, improved living standards, better nutrition, better hygiene, um, and a successful public health uh, campaign, including the introduction of vaccination and antibiotics, brought that number and the incidence of TB right down. So much so that it's down to about one in 200,000 in the whole of the UK today. So it's not really a problem in the UK anymore. But the fact is, TB remains a devastating disease. 10.6 million people got TB in 2022. It's still prevalent in India, China, Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's the single biggest bacterial or viral killer causing 1.3 million deaths in 2022. So it's still a massive problem globally. And you're probably thinking, didn't you just say we have a vaccine? We do, it's called BCG, and I and most of the older members of the audience would have got that vaccine when we were younger. It's a version of the cow form of TB that's been made safe to give to people. It was introduced in 1921, and it's still used around the world today, especially in places where TB is, uh, there's a lot of TB about. And normally vaccines are a really good way of protecting people against disease. But the strange thing about the BCG vaccine is that it's good for helping babies and really young children from some of the more serious forms of TB that they can get. But the problem is that it's not very good at protecting against the form of TB that most adults get, the form of TB that we get in the lungs. So we have a vaccine, but it doesn't really protect most people. So it's not the best as vaccines go. And again, you're probably wondering, didn't you say there were antibiotics? Well, we have antibiotics. The antibiotics we've had since about the mid 1900s and they work really well. But the problem is you have to take lots of them and for a very long time. So with most bacteria, you might have one antibiotic and you take it for a week or maybe two. With TB, you start with four antibiotics for two months and then you go down to two of those original four antibiotics for another four months. That's incredibly onerous and it means it could be difficult to get people to complete their antibiotic treatments. So there's lots of problems. But what's being done about TB? Well, the WHO have set an ambitious goal to end the global TB epidemic by 2035. To do this, it set out a three-pillar approach. Pillar one, integrated patient-centered care and prevention. That's things like diagnosing TB and treating people appropriately. Pillar two, bold policies and supportive systems. That's things like frameworks for infection control and dealing with social determinants like poverty. And pillar three, intensified research and innovation. That's things like finding new tools and strategies. And progress had been made up until 2019, but with the COVID-19 pandemic, there was, that was a major setback. Access to care fell substantially, and so the number of people getting ill and dying from TB increased for the first time in many years. There's been some recovery, but most countries are still far away from meeting those milestones and targets that have been set out. So it's an ambitious goal, and there's still lots to be done. And I work in Lalita Ramakrishnan's group in the Department of Medicine in the University of Cambridge. And we're really interested in studying and understanding the bacteria that cause TB and how it interacts with the body. We study the fish version of tuberculosis as a surrogate for human TB because it's easier, safer, and has been a really powerful research model. And we look at the bacteria. What is it that they need to survive in people? How do they avoid being killed? What tools do they use? And then we also look at the immune system. How does it attack the bacteria? And how does it keep disease under control? And we look at how these two interact with each other. And we think that understanding the details 
of those interactions will be essential to discover and develop, a, develop new ways of treating and tackling this infection. So we're not exactly looking for things that will directly translate to the clinic, but of course the relevance to human TB and disease is really important to us. And in fact, many of these projects that we've looked at that understand the basic biology of TB have actually had a direct translational element. And so in the time that I have today, I'd like to tell you a bit about the work that I've been doing and some others in the lab um, and how some of the insights that we've made in this basic biology of TB might contribute to that pillar three of achieving this ambitious goal of ending TB. So when someone breathes in the TB bacterium, the bacteria makes its way down into the lower lung where it's eaten by an immune cell called the macrophage. And macrophage just means big eater, so this large eater cell eats the bacteria. And then it has a bunch of different things that it uses to try and kill the bacteria. So it uses acid, it uses proteins that can chew up different parts of the bacteria, it uses reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, and much more. And a lot of the time, those will kill the bacteria. But sometimes the bacteria can survive and cause disease. And the bacteria has a lot of different ways that it uses to try and defend itself to increase its chances of surviving. So imagine the bacteria is a fortress under siege. It's been surrounded by this opposing immune system army. And this army is throwing all sorts of things at this fortress. They've got bombs, battering rams, flaming arrows and cannonballs and so on. What's the fortress's first line of defense? What's its primary protection? Well, it's a defensive wall. Walls and clothes they protect and they control entry and exit. And one of TB's main defenses is a complex cell wall that surrounds the bacteria. And it's a really impressive barrier. It's much better at keeping things out than most other bacterial cell walls. And those, but this bacterial cell wall can help defend against attacks of the immune system and deadly antibiotics. And a really important part of this cell wall is a protein that I work on. That protein is called ERP. And it's a really interesting protein because it's only found in the family of bacteria that TB is a part of. You don't find it in any other bacteria. And what we found is that this protein is really important for keeping that wall impermeable. It seems like it's something a bit like maybe the mortar between the bricks or some kind of supporting beam that holds parts of the wall together. And if you don't have this protein, it completely changes what the outside of the bacteria look like. They go from having this mountainous terrain with peaks and troughs to this flat plain. And that change has a devastating effect on what those bacteria, how, they, how those bacteria behave. All sorts of things can now get through this cell wall into the bacteria much more easily. Without this protein, it's much easier for those macrophages to kill the bacteria. And it's not just one way of killing, it's multiple. Without this protein, the bacteria can't grow as well and they can't cause disease in the same way. And that's not all. Some of the most important antibiotics we use can also kill this bacteria more easily than the wild type. And I've been really interested in this because it's telling us a lot about how important this cell wall is for keeping things out and how important that is for the bacteria in how they cause disease. And also, although we're not working on it, this could be a really good drug target. If you could somehow stop this protein from being made or getting to its position in the cell wall, you'd make it easier for both the immune system and antibiotics to kill TB. And not only that, you'd have a way of hitting just TB and not the other good bacteria that you find in your body. And that would be really cool. So ERP is this really important protein that's keeping this bacterial cell wall impermeable. So back to our fortress under siege. We've got a strong wall that's strengthened by the protein ERP. And that's pretty good at keeping things out. But the immune army is throwing bombs through the gaps in the walls. Now in this bacteria fortress, you've got some bomb specialists. They're really good at diffusing bombs. Some are good at big ones, some are good at small ones. And they can deal with lots of them. But what's another way that we could deal with the bombs? Well, one way would be to load them into a catapult and fling them right back outside the walls. And the bacteria do something a little bit like that. They've got ways to deal with some of the attacks the immune system uses. They can get rid of some of them, they can learn how to deal with some others. But one way they do it is to switch on pumps. And these pumps are called efflux pumps. They pump things from the inside of the bacteria to the outside of the bacteria. Some of these pumps are on all the time, and other of them just get switched on when the bacteria get eaten by that cell, the macrophage. And these pumps are able to pump out, pump out multiple things. It might be a pump mostly for oranges, 
but it can also pump out things that are a similar size and shape to oranges. So oranges, but maybe also tennis balls. And a former PhD student in the lab, Kirsten Adams, she worked out how one of these pumps does just that. In the macrophage, the bacteria switch on this pump, and it can get rid of things that the macrophage is using to try and kill the bacteria. But it can also pump out one of the best antibiotics that we have for TB, an antibiotic called rifampicin. Not all the bacteria switch on these pumps, but the bacteria that do switch on these pumps can tolerate rifampicin a little bit better. We call them tolerant bacteria because they can survive a bit better in the presence of this antibiotic. And that makes them harder to kill. In fact, these bacteria are a big problem in the treatment of TB and are thought to be the main reason why TB takes at least six months to treat. The idea is that if you stop treatment early, that some of these bacteria wouldn't have died and then they can just pop right back up again and start the infection. So an urgent goal in TB treatment is to overcome this tolerance. And what Kirsten identified was a drug called verapamil that could stop the pump working as well. Verapamil is already used in humans safely. And so the idea is that if you use it with rifampicin, the bacteria can't pump out as well as it used to be able to. And you might be able to reduce this group of tolerant bacteria. So to find out if these targeting these tolerant bacteria actually can shorten treatment times, we need to do clinical trials with verapamil, and those are currently ongoing. And then more recently, another PhD student from the lab, Alex Lake, she tried a couple of other drugs that are quite like verapamil. They're a group of drugs that are used to block acid reflux. They're called proton pump inhibitors. And she found a number of them that were even better than verapamil at blocking this pumped activity. And what's really exciting about these is that they are some of the most prescribed drugs already used. So they're safe and people can take them without having any problems. So now what would be great is if we could look at some of those drugs and use those and go forward into preclinical and clinical trials with those. And the hope is that using these safe, widely used drugs with TB, that it might be, make it possible to shorten treatment times, which would make a huge difference to TB treatment. So we've identified some pumps that pump out antibiotics and some drugs to block them. Back to our siege on the fortress. We've got a strong wall that's, protected, that's protecting, that's strengthened by this protein herb. It's pretty good keeping things out. The things that do get in, we've got efflux pumps to catapult them back out. Now, let's imagine one of these antibiotics that we're giving from the doctor divisional reinforcements is a poison gas pellet. It would be great to fling it back out, but the catapults can't always get there in time. How could we deal with the poison gas? Well, we could give them uh, an antitoxin, or maybe we could give people gas masks, and then we wouldn't need to worry about this poison pellet anymore. And the bacteria do something a little bit like that. The bacteria change something about either the antibiotic itself or the target of the antibiotic, which means that that antibiotic doesn't kill the bacteria anymore. And that's a big cause for concern. TB that is resistant to that drug rifampicin and one of the other drugs that we use, they're called multidrug resistant TB. And in 2022, 40,000 people got multidrug resistant TB. That's about 4% of the people that got TB. And up until last year, cases uh, of multidrug resistant TB were um, pretty bad. You, the success rate on the kind of antibiotic regime that was available at the time, the success rate was about 50%. And in the last year, a new six month treatment um, has been introduced and it has about a 90% success rate, which is incredible. And the key to that uh, new uh, regime is this new TB antibiotic, which is the first TB antibiotic that's been um, approved for use in the last 50 years called bedaquiline. And this drug has already started to and will continue to revolutionize the treatment of multidrug resistant TB. However, TB is a wily opponent and already there are bacteria that are resistant to bedaquiline. And the main way that they've done that is by using a pump. It's a pump that the bacteria use to collect iron to allow it to be able to grow. And it just so happens that this pump that's used for collecting iron can also pump out bedaquiline. Lucky for the bacteria. So what they do is they just make lots more of this pump. And a current PhD student in the lab, Adam Fenton, he's studying this pump. 
Using AI predictions, he's been able to predict the structure of the pump and then experimentally work out which parts of the pump are important for pumping this drug out, but Aquilin. It's a bit like he's got a model of a slide and he's just poked it in a bunch of different places to find where the entrance to the slide is. And so now that he's worked out where the entrance is, there's, we have that information and we can use some other software to try and find different versions of this antibiotic bedaquiline that can still kill TB, but don't fit into the pump anymore. They can't fit into that entrance to the slide. And this is really important because it means that we'll be able to keep using this antibiotic for longer. And excitingly, there are already some versions of bedaquiline that are out there that should be able to kill, but shouldn't be able to be pumped out. So we've worked out how bedaquiline is pumped out and identified versions of it which shouldn't be able to be pumped out. So there's just a couple of examples from the work that's going on in the Ramakrishnan lab. Understanding the basic biology of TB. We've looked at a protein that's important for cell wall and keeping things out, for pumps that we can block and hopefully shorten treatment times with, and then insights that'll hopefully help us to keep antibiotics that we have working for even longer. So yes, TB is still a major problem, but what we found is that the work that we and others are doing to understand that basic biology of TB does have clinical and public health implications. And we're hopeful that the work that we've done and continue to do to understand this bacteria will play a small part in contributing to that ambitious but worthy goal of ending TB for good. Thank you. <laughs>